from beginning to end, we are called as the church to gather together to give honor to him. First Chronicles chapter 29, starting in the 10th verse. If you were a member of one of the adult Sunday school classes, then you probably are totally prepped to dig deeper into this passage of God's word. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. I believe your Sunday school lesson was entitled God owns everything. Paul carried that on into New Testament times as he gathered around on the missionary journeys before going to Jerusalem. That last time, he gathered the offering. He talked to the church at Corinth and bragged about what the, church in the churches in Macedonia did to gather an offering for the church back in Jerusalem. And he had a twofold prayer for Himself, He asked the church to pray that he would be kept safe from the unbelievers in Judea and that this offering that he had gathered from all these churches would be received with favor by the people, the very people that uh, are the recipients. I can't expect that um, a gift would be received with anything but favor, but you know that happens, right? Somebody comes to give their very best, and somebody else looks at that very best with contempt. I think we, we need to learn the Lord's way today. That we are not the ones to judge the very best another person has to give. We probably can all think of a person in our life who is very handicapped. And maybe the rest of the world would look at that person as somewhat worthless or useless. Maybe a life without much purpose or meaning. But you, because you knew and loved that person who was very handicapped, you had been given spiritual eyes to see something in that person's life that God saw. A commitment, a devotion. So today we're going to talk about heart, mind, and strength. We've all heard from Deuteronomy and the Gospels that the first and greatest commandment is to love God. That's it. Love God. How? How? It's not just words. Oh, I love you, God. It's everything you are. It can involve your soul. And some might want to describe what is a soul. Some would say the soul is the mind. It's your personality. Some would think that soul and spirit are the same thing. In the scriptures, don't exactly lay out the differences. But when God's word says, love the Lord your God... With all your heart, most of you could say, okay, well, I know what that means. That's with everything that is within me. But sometimes the heart wants to rule in the body of Christ. But the head of the body of Christ in the same church, even sitting at the same committee meeting, wants to rule over the heart. Well, we know you have good intentions, the head people say to the heart people. But the numbers just don't line up. And so the heart person can get mad at the head person or the head person can look down at the heart person as being flaky and unprepared and unrealistic, lacking organizational skills. And then there's the vigor of youth, the vitality and strength of the generation that's coming forward. And they don't know why everybody argues in church because they're not yet grown up. And maybe they've got something that the grown-ups need to look at. But it's not too long before even the vitality, the vigor, and the strength, or the might of youth is corrupted by factions between the head people and the heart people among the adults. Love the Lord your God with all your... And talking to the whole people of God, but all of us as individuals, we can ask the Lord, how, Lord, might I love you more with my mind? 
with my personality. You have wired me differently than other people, and yet there are other people who really get me. They understand me because we think alike. Our personalities are somewhat similar, or there's something that connects. Lord, how might I worship you with all my mind, with all my heart, and with all my strength? Well, we're going to bring up some thinking deacons. Servants, that's the word deacon. Where we get the word deacon is the servant or minister heart. We have a servant set apart who is a thinker. His name is Kirk Harjo. But he, thank God, doesn't come alone. He has a helpmate who has helped sort out his thinking at times. We're going to bring Kurt and Gene up front. And I'd just like you to come stand right here. In this little spot of light that's right here. Um, Gene, if you could help him up, please. <laughs> All right, just come stand right here in light. And what I put up there to represent thinking people, why don't you guys kind of hold on to hands and let's show, show us how much you love each other. All right. Well, I can do better than that. <laughs> he kisses her hand at every meal. Come on over here in the light. All right, here we go. All right. These two, uh, they have a special ministry among us. There's lots that they can do. Kurt can lead the choir, but you notice leading the choir is actually mathematics. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. He really is thinking math the whole time. Yeah, there's art involved, but for I know for Kurt, there's math involved. And if he gets really happy, he forgets the math for a moment and goes to the heart. Oh, you guys are so good, he says to the choir. And, you know, for that reason, we don't really want him to get his hearing aids. Because he sure is encouraging. He is encouraging to his choir. Well, these two are thinkers. And, yes, they've got great hearts as well because they're seasoned Christians. But one thing I heard this deacon say once is that he was trained in law enforcement, his career, 400 men under him. He was trained to be a problem solver. And so he said, in the church, if you wanted to come to me with a problem you have, I've been trained to offer solutions. And then he added a caveat. You might not like the solution I offer, but I think it'll work. Now, if you came to these two, they would invite you into their home. They would feed you. You'd watch him after they pray. He kisses his wife's hand. And it's not for show. He's been doing it all along. They would feed you. They would sit down. You'd watch a movie together, a video together, or sit at the table and talk, have a Bible study, or just plain have some fun. But if you would grow to trust these two with problems that occur in your family, in your finances, even problems, relational problems, I think that their ears and their mouths can be trusted, that they can hear confidentiality confidentially, any of the problems that you might be facing. And you can hold them to it, that they'll offer you a solution. Understanding that that solution might not be the perfect solution, but at least you know you're not alone. You don't have to face the problems by yourself. And two are better than one. In a three-stranded cord, this deacon family and you and your family or you and your situation, that three-stranded cord is not easily broken. And you have people like this in your corner, standing in the gap, praying for you, and thinking alongside you, listening to you, and offering the best that their years of experience has to offer in the way of wisdom. Now, I've attached a, an idea from today's verse along with this. Who am I? In this Lord's Supper that we're about to partake together, I want you to be thinking this question. David asked it. Who am I, Lord? Who am I? That's a pretty good question. Philosophers throughout the generations have asked that question. Who am I? That involves why am I here? Who am I? And for the believer, who am I in relation to God? Am I anybody special? Does God even know I exist? Why, all those why questions are involved in who am I? And then when God blesses us to be part of a body, we 
also, along with David, ought to ask, and who are your people, Lord? Who are we? And David's prayer is about something that's happening in that generation, something that has just happened. And he, he's really asking himself, golly, God, I can't believe that you've allowed me to live to see this day and to see these people today do what they've done. When we share the Lord's Supper, I'm going to ask Kurt and Jean, along with our other two deacon families, to come sit at the front row and worship. And at some point in that service, if they've worshipped, I don't want them to feel like they have to the whole time, but at some point they will choose to come stand at the altar and receive anybody, all three of our deacon families, to receive anybody that has a prayer request or a concern. Not a counseling session, but just a networking point, a point of contact where they get your name and they know that you want to be on their hearts during the days, the weeks, the months, even the years ahead. And I trust that today will go down in our history as we ask, who am I, Lord, and who are we today? And why have you blessed us to see this day and the days of the generation immediately coming up? Thank you, Kurt and Jean. Let's bring up Wolfgang and Delin. I want to talk about the heart. Even in this family, I think we've got a heart and a head. And sometimes they, they switch back and forth. Sometimes they're both all heart. Sometimes they're both all head. They're, they're a curious mix. But the reason I've asked them to represent heart for us is because God blessed Delin with that desire for seven days of prayer during this year. And that involves the heart of the church. Because as we pray about pragmatic matters and item, line, item lines and numbers, as we pray about problems, we get past uh, surface entry level problems and we dig down to the heart of the matter in prayer. And God changes the hearts of those who are committed to prayer. Because they might start out praying one way. Paul said, I pray with my mind, but I also pray with my heart. That we need both. And so these two are committed to prayer. So are Kurt and Jean, but I'm asking them to really help me with thinking through and offering solutions for problems that face our people. I'm asking these two to continue being the heart of Bell Road and watching the heart of Bell Road. We, like Abraham, when we pray, we know we are called to intercede on behalf of the nation. It is not right for us to say, God, help all those filthy sinners out there. We're nice and clean in here, so we don't need you to forgive us of anything. But help all those people to come to repentance. That's not the heart of an intercessor. The heart of the intercessor claims the sins of the nation as their own. They, they take responsibility for the shortcomings of the people of the nation and the people of God. So the verse we'll consider today, Wolfgang Delin, is that God tests our heart. I've heard Wolfgang on a number of occasions tell us that the heart is wickedly deceitful. God tests our heart, and he's pleased when he finds integrity. He knows that we are emotional beings, and we might flip-flop on issues from time to time, even though we know the Word, maybe we've just taught the Word or just preached the Word, or we just said amen to something, and then even an hour later, we are denying Christ. We're denying His power to uh, transform our minds and to cleanse our hearts. We know that. God knows that. But He's pleased when He does find integrity. So during the Lord's Supper, they also will be sitting up toward the front. And at some point, They'll come to the front to receive anybody who would like ongoing prayer for any matter. If there's an issue you've already taken a solution for, maybe uh, a solution to a problem has already been offered and you accepted it. That could be on any level, relational, financial, a personal solution to a problem. But now your heart is divided. You're second-guessing whether that was the right decision to make. It's too late to make the decision, it's already been made. You need some heart people 
to say, well, we're just going to pray through. God loves you whether it was the right choice or, or not. We're going to love you through this. We're going to get to the heart of the matter. Thank you, Wolfgang and Delin. And now we're going to bring up Brandon and Heidi. And you might wonder, uh, I understood the chalkboard and this working out of a mathematical problem and the heart and testing the heart, but what is this with a guitar held up? Well, there's a song that we sing, Your Love is Strong. And anybody that can hold a guitar up over their head, it's a sign of youthfulness, vitality, and strength. And besides, if you were to Google strength, you're going to see all sorts of pictures we don't want to show on a Sunday morning. You know, it's big bodybuilders, men or women. That's not what we're talking about. When we're talking about might and strength, oh yeah, it, it does involve the activity of our limbs, but it's so much more than that. But I want these two to represent looking out for the next generation that's coming up because that is really the strength of our church. It's not the old folks. The old folks have the heart and the head and there's strength there, but as far as the ability to run, like my son and Wolfgang's son, they're running a marathon as we speak, 26.2 miles down in San Diego. Huh? They're done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, let's just say they're running it as we speak. That involves youth and vitality, and we are asking these deacons to help us to deal with issues that involve uh, youth and to think about strength. I don't want to just have chronological age and, okay, you, you guys are going to deal with anybody 30 and under. I don't want that because maybe a 26-year-old needs to talk to an 80-year-old. Maybe the, how old are you guys in your 30s? 33, okay. That's a wonderful, ripe, young age. I remember when I was that age. I remember it distinctly because that's the age Jesus was when his ministry came to a close. But we think you have a bright future ahead of you guys. I noticed that our deacon, you know, he's the old man in the worship team. He's the aged, seasoned deacon of the worship team. And so maybe when you see peace and unity and joy among diverse, um, difficult personalities, it might be because the gentleman deacon is there watching over the kids. <laughs> and two are better than one in this case. I thank the Lord for Brandon and Heidi. And that's like Brandon holding up his guitar there. Is that um, uh, we are celebrating that our greatest investment is in the generation that is yet to come. We're going to see that in our scripture today. These two will also be sitting up at the front, and at some point they'll come stand, and if you would like prayer for them. Now, you could be that person that says, I'll take all the prayer I can get, and you might just go to all three. But remember, it can't be a long time of counseling. The main thing is to let these people know that you would like them walking alongside you. Thank you. So here is verse 12 and 13 from 1 Chronicles 29. Wealth and honor come from you. And I put wealth in a great big font because I think that wealth at Bell Road Baptist Church would be a wonderful thing to celebrate. And I do believe this, that if you come to the finance class tonight, how to manage your money, you will acquire wealth. And it'll be because you've been living your life according to God's principles, not because of some magic mathematical uh, principle, but what Paul said in 2 Corinthians, if you sow generously, then you shall also reap generously. Yeah, wealth is money, but it's also contentment for the Christian. Lord, thank you. Thank you. It's contentment and gratitude that you have blessed me to meet all my basic needs and also given me a heart and a, an ability to bless others even financially, to help get them started or to help them get through a rough time. Wealth and honor come from you. See, everything comes from the Lord. This is David singing with his heart and his mind praise, leading the people in praise. 
God, you are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. So, Lord, anything good that's happening here, if the guitarist is actually able to hold up the guitar and to shout out the Word of God to Melody, if the keyboard player is actually able to play a song through perfectly with no mistakes, great honor comes from that kind of strength and vitality. Some of us who are being called upon to sing or to play during this summer stock season, we haven't played maybe in 20 years. I've been asked to play some piano for you, and I had to be honest with Diana. You know, Diana, I don't play like I used to play. I'm going to have to practice if I'm going to give my best on Sunday morning, because I know that if I just sat there right now, it might be the best on the inside. I might be thinking it's the best, but it's not going to sound like maybe it did 20 years ago. But any strength, honor, power, wealth, anything that God gives us in our youthful vigor, it all comes from Him. Strength and power to exalt, it comes from His hands. He gives strength to all. So we ask Him, Lord, will you give us strength, might, youthfulness, vitality, vigor, to serve you wholeheartedly. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to what? To give as generously as this. See, what has taken place here is that David is coming to the end of his earthly ministry. He had some desire some years before as he looked around at his couch, the cars in the driveway, and the big flat screen TV, or the equivalent thereof, of a prosperous household. And he thought, here I am sitting in the lap of luxury, watching my big screen, flat screen TV with big sound and big car and big couch and big cupboards and big refrigerator and freezer and all this abundance, and yet, the roof is leaking at God's house. The parking lot is cracked at God's house. See, it's that kind of an equivalent. And so David had the thought in his mind, it's not right for the Ark of the Covenant to sit in a tent when I'm living in a palace of cedar. This is maturity for the young shepherd boy. He desires to build a house for God. He runs it by the prophet, and the prophet says, this is a good thought that you have. Speaking for God, he says, you, you run with this idea to build a house for God, but you will not be the one to actually build it. And there's reasons for that, and you can read the Word and pick up that story. But I think the glorious thing about this story is you're supposed to spend the rest of your life, David, gathering the resources for the next generation to have, to hold, and with which to build a house for God. So David asks, on that day when so great of an offering has been accumulated to build this house, David asks, who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. Into this world I came naked, and I leave the same way. I came with nothing, and I leave with nothing. Anything I have to offer on the altar. Barnabas knew that when he gave the money for the field that he sold, when he offered it at the altar. He knew he, didn't, he wasn't born with that field. That field is God's, and God has given it to him. Any prosperity, any ability to give has come from God's hand for those who are mature, who look at strength, heart, mind, all the resources of God's people, wealth and honor and power with that reference. Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. We are foreigners and strangers in your sight. 
as were all our ancestors. And I'm reminded of the tithe, that the man presenting the tithe is to share that once my forefathers were foreigners in this land, which means we owned no land, we had no possessions, we were aliens, strangers, foreigners, but you have prospered us in this land. I have benefit of my parents' hard work and my grandparents' hard work, their labor, what struggles my great-grandparents went through. I have experienced benefits, and it all has come from your hand. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. It's a pity that there are people in this generation who have not yet learned these truths. Who am I and who are my people? Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a temple for your holy name comes from your hand, and all of it belongs to you. This is really going to help us as we take possession of this land God has granted to Bell Road Baptist Church for this generation. We come to a land, maybe you just started here six months ago. You drive in a driveway and you look, the house is already built. There's already pavement. You have yet to possess it because in your mind you're somewhat still a stranger or an alien. But at some point God is going to say, this is my house and mi casa es su casa. You know, I think that means that my house is your house. And if it truly is, then at some point you're going to help do the chores. I love the other side of that hospitality, that the real joy comes from saying, yes, this is my house, and I'm going to take responsibility. I know, my God, that you test the heart, and you are pleased with integrity. All these things I have given willingly and with honest intent. And now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. And this is so much more than the money, the currency, or the check that goes into the offering plate. There might be a person that's very faithful in that type of giving. But compared to all the other service that's going on in that person's life, this is just the first fruits. This this tithe is just the beginning of the rest of the week for that person because they are wholeheartedly devoted to building God's house in his name with joy. God tests our heart, and he is pleased when he finds integrity. Today our deacons, they are thinking and praying about the mind at Bell Road Baptist Church. Not the minds, but who we are as a personality, as a thinking church. They're thinking about the heart of Bell Road. Not all our hearts, but the one heart. You know, what is the heart? What is the heart cry of the people of God as we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs? And do we have a divided heart or have we come to that place of having one heart, one mind? God is pleased when he tests our heart and discovers integrity among us. Lord, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, keep these desires and thoughts in the hearts of your people forever and keep their hearts loyal to you. So, Wolfgang Dillon, do you see your assignment today that, like David, you're going to see some people that come to the Lord's table. That means they want to have the heart of Christ. They want to take the body of Christ. They want to drink the blood of Christ in communion with him and with his people. It doesn't get any better than this. When a person has examined their ways and chooses, as we're going to today, We're going to invite the people of God, one by one, family by family, row by row, to come up and to receive the Lord's Supper. Now, if you're not able to walk the distance easily, then at the end of 
uh, after everybody else who's going to come to the table has, then if you raise your hand at the table, Brother Bob Knapp and I will come to the table or to your seat and serve you there. It doesn't get any better than this. The people of God, having confessed their sins and having chosen afresh to eat his body and to drink his blood in community with God's people. And so those who are caring about the matters of the heart need to pray, Lord, bless these people's hearts. Bless the heart of Bell Road. And Lord, we ask you to keep our hearts loyal to you. And then look at strength. Give my son Solomon the wholehearted devotion. I'm quite a bit older than this young man who's doing this stuff this morning. And I already know the struggles of a young man and the struggles of a person who's trying to use strength, abilities, vitality of youth, trying to have all that make sense in a unified manner, taking in consideration the entire people of God and all the opinions and the desires and the musical tastes and the theological interest of the people and somehow trying to offer a worship that everybody, everybody can arise and say, yea, amen, hallelujah. God is good all the time. And so for those of us who are 20 or older, we ought to look at our worship leader in this chapter of Bell Row Baptist Church, and we ought to think, what's 20 years going to do to that man? What's he going to be like at age 40 or at age 70, should the Lord tarry? Is he going to be well-grounded in the love of God and the love of God's people? If it had anything to do with us, were we the people that prayed, Lord, as he represents an upcoming generation, as he represents those today who are only 10 years old. He's closer to 10 than he is to 80. So he, he represents the 10-year-old today. As we pray for these 10 through 19-year-olds, give my son Solomon. They're going to inherit all this, or they're going to lose it. Solomon's son, we know Rehoboam, didn't do too well, did he? David prayed for Solomon, his son. Lord, give my son Solomon the wholehearted devotion to keep your commands, statutes, and decrees, and to do everything to build the palatial structure for which I have provided. If you took that verse out of context, you'd go, David, who do you think you are? You didn't provide anything. Hold on, hold on, hold on. He already said, everything that I've given has come from your hand. But the fact is, my free will chose to spend the rest of my life doing this. This is the most important thing I've done with my life, to, to provide for the next generation. So, Lord, I ask you to bless my son with wholehearted devotion that he will do everything with the right heart to build the palatial structure for which I have provided. So right now, Brandon's playing guitar, but there's probably going to be a time when Brandon sets the guitar down. And maybe some young lady will ask the old man, uh, I hear you play guitar. Would you mind play, playing a song for us on Sunday morning? And he goes, well, I don't know, sister. It's been a while. That day may never come, but wouldn't, what a wonderful day that if, if we live to see that day and remember, oh, wow, that was actually prophesied. That was talked about way back when. And he go, well, son, they don't use these anymore, but I have some digital pedals. And if I can find a power source to run it, I'd like to play it for you the way we did way back in 011. Then David said to the whole assembly, praise the Lord, your God. So... They all praised the Lord, the God of their fathers. They bowed down, prostrating themselves 
before the Lord and the king. This do in remembrance of me. I thank the Lord for being able to study the life of Paul because it makes everything in our traditions more meaningful when we realize and remember Paul wasn't there on the night Jesus was betrayed. But Paul was chosen to hear Jesus, the ascended Christ, to spend time with him, to see in vision the risen Christ who would speak to him. I don't know how Paul received this, but he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. If you are not a Christian, you should not eat the bread or drink the cup. This is for Christians. If there is sin in your life, some preacher might say, if there's sin in your life, don't eat the bread or drink the cup. This preacher says, if there's sin in your life, today you should eat the bread and drink the cup. You should deal with your sin. Confess your sin so that you can come up and receive the forgiveness and demonstrate that through the body and the blood of Jesus and get back on track with the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, that your body was broken for us. We thank you, Lord, that your blood was spilt to wash away our sins. We thank you for that ultimate sacrifice. We know that we could not do it without you, Lord. That salvation comes through you. I pray, Lord, if there is anyone here today that does not know you, Lord, that they search their hearts at this time, that they search their hearts and they ask you into their hearts. They admit that they have sinned and that they truly believe that you died for those sins and God raised you from the dead and they can Confess you as Lord and Savior. And that if they do this, that they come and have fellowship in our, your supper, Lord. I pray, Lord, if there's any sin in the hearts or the lives of those here today, Lord, that they take it to you right now. That they confess that sin to you, Lord that all is right between you and those who are partaking of your suffering. And I thank you for the servants in the front row, Lord, that will be praying for all of us. I thank you for the heart, the mind, and the strength of your body. 
And I pray, Lord, you give us all heart, mind, and strength. In your name we pray. Amen.
this for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory
turns his face away as wounds which mark the chosen one bring many sons to glory sing with me
God and just remembering you at your table and we just we want to make this all about you and not about us God help us to empty ourselves of the things that would get in the way of just fully worshiping you fully living our lives for you God I pray for as I pray for Brandon and Heidi God newly ordained but he's been serving here a long time God I pray a blessing over him I pray that you would um, ignite just you know a fire in all three of the deacons God that would give them inspiration that people would be just trust and God, that they would bring things to them and that you would work through your um, servants, God, and your deacons, that you would to serve the people. I thank you for Pastor and the Pastor Rob, God, that um, for the sermon today, God, I thank you so much that you can speak through your word to us, God, and teach us what you need to tell us, God. Help us to live as Christians, God, through the week, God, not just be Sunday Christians, God, but through the whole week, God, that we would start the day with you and that we would um, remember you and seek to walk in your way all through the day, God. Help us to be the light in the world. In your name, amen. Let's stand together, shake hands with one another, and be friends. God's grace be with you. So when Denver